Welcome back to the Tank Museum Bovington and our tour of the Cruiser Mark VI, the A15 Mark III, also known as Crusader. Now, the earlier versions with the two-pounder turret had a sort of a single-piece umbrella hatch that would come up and back horizontally on four hinges. With the six-pounder on the Crusader III, however, they've changed it. And watch this, with my little finger only, you can open and lock the hatches. Uh, this is a great improvement if you have to get out of the tank in a hurry, which unfortunately was often the case. Lock the other side, you now have a huge access port to get in, and I'm sure the cameraman will be happy. So let's check out the insides. Now, the reason I was able to open up the hatches so easily are these springs here, which are reasonably well tensioned so that they allow me to assist in opening, but they also keep the hatch closed. Now, the turret. Originally, the idea was that they were going to design an entirely new turret for the six pounder on Crusader. However, uh, what they ended up doing was just being lazy, taking the extant two pounder turret and shoving a six pounder into it and then seeing how much room there was left over for everyone and everything else. Well, the answer is not much. We have now regressed. We've gone from a three-man turret to a two-man turret, and what was originally a five-man tank is now a three-man tank. Doubtless, the maintenance tasks have been spread far more liberally. The turret did have a reputation for having good elbow room, at least, and it does have a full rotating turret basket. Now, the position of the commander from the outside of the tank until I got in here, I was wondering why there was a periscope far to the rear in the hatch, and also on the commander's side, another periscope further forward. But now I am sitting inside the tank, I understand why. The seat does not fold out of the way, it's stuck here on the side, right next to the breech. And it does seem to be the best place for this person to be seated. I did try, for the sake of the experiment, standing to the rear what I ordinarily would expect the commander, or loader in this case, I guess both, uh, to be, and try going through the motions of getting around out of the ready bin and then into the tube. It just doesn't work, especially if you wanted to add a bit more of a recoil guard than currently exists. Instead, by seating a little bit further forward, uh, he has a bit of room to work. But note also that I am seated facing to the rear. There is a seven round ready rack directly where your feet would be, I don't care how short you are, directly where your feet will be if you are facing forward. And obviously you can't be facing left because then your legs are under the gun tube and then you're stopping it from elevating or depressing. Instead, it looks like what you do is you grab the round, bring it up, back, and with your left hand, place it into the breech. And as I'm playing around with it, and it is a vertically sliding breech as you can see, this is a six pounder gun, but for some reason it has etched in here 75 millimeter. V, which I have to assume is like 75mm Gun Breach Mark V. I need to check this out because I don't know why there is a 75mm listed here on the back of the 6-pounder. Perhaps the breeches were interchangeable for some reason. Anyway, because I am now facing to the rear, bear in mind I am also the commander, I can't see anything. Every now and then, so I load the round, I turn forward, I look through my little periscope, which will rotate and elevate, granted, and then look to the rear again. This is not a case of commanding the tank. Now, perhaps one option would be that the commander would actually simply stand there and command while the gunner would perform the multiple duties of loading and shooting. I would need to track down a veteran, somebody track down a veteran and ask them how it worked because I'm not seeing an efficient way of doing this. And now, of course, needs must, and I'm sure somebody figured out the best way of doing it, I just haven't read it yet. If that wasn't enough, of course, he is the commander of maybe a platoon or a company. And to do this, he has the ever-present number 19 wireless set in the back of the turret. That's a very good wireless set, shows up near the beginning of World War II and just keeps going and going. You'll see it in service well after World War II as well. Had a voice communication range of about 10 miles on a good day in clear conditions, which 
was quite adequate for what it was being asked to do. If that wasn't enough of his duties, however, uh, in addition to playing with the 73 or so rounds of six pounder, uh, which I should add, some books will say 65, some say 73. David Fletcher's book says both 65 and 73 in the same book for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, I am going with 73. It does seem to be the more reputable number until I can find the manual somewhere. He also has the two inch bomb thrower, which obviously has been dismounted here, but will project out to around here. And he has all the stowage for the two inch bombs here up front, a little bit to the right. And there is another large rack of two inch bombs behind the gunner. So I don't know how much smoke you were planning on throwing around, but evidently it was a lot. As I'm looking down into the rear, I am noticing a lack of a firewall. Uh, there's a sort of a partial firewall. It's not completely open to the engine bay, but I, I'm looking down, I see engine, and I don't see any possibility of a door that may have fallen off or been removed. I mean, unless they did something very strange in the restoration of this vehicle, but I'm pretty sure what I'm looking at here is original condition. So this is doubtless going to be quite noisy and quite aromatic. Now, it's not unusual to find the lubrication chart as part of the operator's manual. I don't often see, however, the lubrication chart riveted, or in this case, screwed to the inside of the turret wall. They obviously really, really want to make sure you follow this. And it's simple enough to understand mine. So every 100 miles, you go to item A, which are all the spring eyes for the suspension. Uh, there are 10 nipples to be done, presumably one for each wheel, using C600 lubricant. So this is simple. Uh, or every 300 miles, you go with the fan bearings. What's a little bit more interesting, though, is that you change this oil tank every 600 miles. That is a lot of oil changes that you got to do on your typical tank. The other thing I find interesting about this is that this diagram is of an early Crusader. You have the two-pounder gun and you have the little Bisa turret on the hull. So either this was a converted two-pounder, or more likely, I think, they simply didn't change out the lubrication chart and just kept on production with that. Anyway, that is it for the commander side. Hopping over to the gunner now. The gunner side seems quite miserable indeed. Now, of course, he's down and forward, so it doesn't matter that there's no periscope in his hatch. Uh, he, though he does have one a little bit further forward above his sight. His seating position, I think, um, is pretty typical of the early war British tanks. You have a power traverse for your left hand, or by use of this toggle, you could select the manual traverse here. And elevation is by use of the shoulder pad. So you simply wrap your shoulder in here, you have your hand down here on the trigger, the other hand on the traverse, and you aim at your side, up or down. Now, the catch is that I am so low down in this that I am basically sitting on my heels. Um, I almost wonder if I shouldn't be sitting on the floor to do this. And there is no seat in this tank. And I honestly cannot tell if this is because the seat has been removed or because there simply was no option to put a seat here, especially if you're trying to aim up and down and have a bit of movement. Uh, I, I especially you want to elevate this gun. How, I don't care how short your body is. A typical person is not going to be able to sit on a seat here and elevate this gun very far. So this seems very questionable indeed. Now, granted, the shoulder harness will come up a little bit, maybe three inches, uh, but even at that, it's, this is a little bit tight. The gun is the six pounder, 700 weight Mark III, and it is basically originally an anti-tank gun. It's quite fit for purpose. Uh, although the HE round was a little bit anemic, especially when you're talking about fighting at extended ranges in the desert uh, against anti-tank guns, where a good HE round is quite useful. The AP round would leave the muzzle at about 2800 feet per second, which would be good enough to go through four to four and a half inches of armor, which is actually very good and means that even Tigers could, in theory, be fair game. There were subsequent developments, the Little John adapter, and of course by 44, the SVDS, but there's no indication that these are ever used on the uh, Crusaders, at least in any great numbers. Though the Tank Museum does have a 57mm Little John on it uh, at a display elsewhere, and it says for use in the Crusader, but not very many pictures. Indeed, so good was this gun as an anti-tank gun that was used by pretty much the entire Commonwealth and even became the standard US Army anti-tank gun. Also next to him, he has the Besa, so if that goes wrong, he's got to fix it. The ammunition goes over 
the main gun tube into the loading tray on the far side. So that is yet another thing that the commander has to deal with in addition to everything else on his plate. If that wasn't all bad enough, don't forget you've also got to add additional turret storage such as a Bren gun, a Tommy gun, ammunition for them and assorted other things. And I do note down a little bit to the left there, there's more ammunition racks for basic machine guns and the six pounder. So all that done, uh, my limbs are going to be very happy. I'm going to go into the driver's seat now and see if life is any better for him compared to the rest of the crew. Well, they had to get something more or less right. I am actually fairly comfortable in here. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm going to drive from one end of England to the other, but for the sake of spinning around the arena and tank fest, no problem for my six foot five self. I am seated on a seat which is maybe two inches off the uh, whole floor, and it is an adjustable reclining seat. It's not actually all the way back, it's sort of halfway up. Tillers, well, they're located on the sides and they are pneumatic assist, so they are very, very easy to operate. The gear shift for speed, one is front center, then two, three, and four, right in the middle, which I am not a huge fan of, but was very common for British tanks all the way through Centurion. I'm sure people got used to it. Just forward of that is a compass binnacle. They're really a very useful little feature if you're riding around in the desert to know which way you're going and how many miles you've done with your odometer. And yes, you can use a compass inside a metal box like a tank. You just have to make sure it's calibrated correctly. Looking around, firstly on the left-hand side, you can see all the stowage for the six-pounder where the bow gunner used to be. Probably a far better use for that space. And I am starting to come to the conclusion this really was a converted earlier tank, especially with the presence of the round hatch where the uh, gun would ordinarily go. Uh, you can also see fairly clearly the riveted frame uh, around all the various components, especially down in the bow. Uh, two buttons here for the smoke generators. Uh, vision. <laughs> yes. Actually, it's not too bad. Uh, he has a simple sliding block so he can look at the right. The revolver port I've already mentioned. Uh, but direct front, this little apparatus works one of three ways. The easiest is you slide it forward, swing it round, and you're just looking at it out of big hole in the armor. Uh, in combat, this is a periscope, so you are protected. Should the periscope be destroyed, you can come, fold this down, it's on a hinge, and then you lift up an armored housing, and you're looking out two little slits, maybe an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half long, and an eighth of an inch high, maybe even narrower than that. So it is not ideal, but you can get around. Uh, other things to note, well, the standard uh, pedal arrangement of clutch, brake, accelerator. Uh, I say standard, but in Covenanter it was clutch, accelerator, brake, for whatever reason. Um, the hatch doors, uh, that's a little bit of a failing point on this vehicle because firstly, the, it's a two-part hatch, neither of which has a spring, so it, it's sheer muscle power to get that forward bigger one out. And this rear one, as you can see, it locks in place, only opens about 40, you know, okay, maybe a bit more, maybe 60 degrees, which means that it's still quite substantially over my head and gets very much in the way as I get out. So as I'm looking around and I'm thinking to myself, well, I've been in all three pieces of the tank, why would I choose to be a Crusader tanker and not, say, a Sherman tanker? Or, you know, late 1942, early 43. And I am struggling to come up with a single good argument because the Sherman tanker will be more comfortable. He will have a better weapon system. He is more reliable and arguably easier to maintain. So outside of British pride, I'm not really seeing the point on this tank. It's a bit of a shame because it looks nice. Oh well, that's it in here. Time to get out. In action, the British tended to operate in mixed units, and in such cases, the Crusaders would be put as a reconnaissance company, while the American Grants and Shermans would be used to perform the heavy combat roles. This would appear to be a reasonable division of labor, especially given the relative capabilities of the vehicles. Of course, it was also assuming that the Crusaders lasted long enough to perform the reconnaissance role. 
Now, to their credit, Nuffields undertook a very determined effort to fix these reliability problems, but it was too late, the reputation was tarnished, and the crews were sold on the reliability of the American vehicles. 5,464 Crusaders were built in total. They split up more or less as follows. Somewhere over 2,000 Crusaders 1 and 2, 1,700 Crusader 3, 112 Crusader OP, 950 Crusader anti-aircraft, mainly of the 20mm type, and 600 gun tractors. And thus we come to the end of our tour of the Crusader.